going to start with a quote. Iran, Syria, and North Korea should heed the lesson of Iraq. Does anyone remember who that quote is from? Close. John Bolton. Uh, he's, uh, he was, at the time, in 2003, the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control. Bolton made this threatening statement on April 10, 2003, the day after the fall of Baghdad by the U.S. and its allies. And the reason I bring this up is to uh, basically put the situation of Syria in context of the uh, imperialist plans for the region. Um, at the time, it was talked about a lot, and uh, you know what was talked about was that specifically Syria was going to be next in line after Iraq. But of course, what happened was that due to Iraqi resistance, this didn't become possible. The Iraqis resisted, so the plans for redrawing the map of the Middle East, which is what the U.S. had in mind, it had to be shelved because uh, it turned out to be not the cakewalk that they expected. So as we talk about the Arab Spring and um, uh, the developments in different countries, Egypt, Syria, Libya, Bahrain, Jordan, and the other countries in the Middle East and North Africa, we have to keep the different character of the states uh, in mind. And what I'm talking about is that there's you know, US client states, reactionary states, such as the one that was um, overthrown in Egypt, um, and um, you know, uh, there's movements in Bahrain, Jordan, and other countries. And then there's uh, the nationalist states that the US has, unlike the other group of countries that the US has always supported and propped up and armed and uh, in some cases uh, funded, uh, these are states such as Libya and Syria that the US and their imperialist allies have always wanted to uh, overthrow. So in the case of uh, Syria, uh, you know, we think it's a complicated situation, but what we get in the, in the US media for the most part is a childishly simple characterization, the dictator versus the people, pro-democracy movement, that kind of a thing. And this is not really a mistake. It's, not, it's actually a conscious effort to prepare public opinion in this country for more US intervention. The US has intervened already, has been involved, as we'll talk about it um, you know, in, in, in the talk but it's a setup for more direct intervention. And of course, uh, had, had it not been for the United Nations and the different reactions to the resolutions that happened different to what happened in Libya, there would already be a no-fly zone and uh, probably the direct involvement, the direct military involvement of the, of the US in the Syrian affair. Um, but again, the real situation is far more complicated. It's a multifaceted uh, civil war right now, and it has many different forces. Before we go into it, let's just briefly review Syria's history to put, put the current um, state of events in its uh, historical context. So for centuries, Syria was a uh, province of the Ottoman Empire. But of course, in World War I, the Ottoman Empire was defeated and dismantled. And after that, the winners of the World War divided up the Middle East amongst themselves. And you know, specifically, the British took Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq, and the French got Lebanon and Syria. With the quick collapse of France uh, in 1940 at the beginning of World War II, uh, the, the French, of course, lost control of uh, much of their colonies, including um, in, in Syria. And there was a temporary occupation by the British forces of Lebanon and Syria. But eventually, in 1946, after World War II, Syria achieved formal independence. In, in 1963, the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party took power in Syria. The Ba'ath Party, which also took power in Iraq in the same year, had been founded in Syria originally in 1947. Under the motto of unity, liberty, socialism, Ba'athism represented a left tendency of the Arab nationalist movement. By the mid-1960s, the left wing of the Ba'ath under the leadership of Salah Jadid had defeated the rightist forces within the party, and that's when Jadid launched a widespread nationalization of industry and agriculture and extensively social, extensive social programs to benefit the workers and their peasants. But in 1967, what happened was that, you know, by this time, with 
imperialist support, Israel had grown into a highly militarized state, and Israel launched a lightning strike against its Arab neighbors. In the in six days, in the Six Day War, uh, Israel defeated Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, uh, conquering the West Bank, Gaza, the Sinai Peninsula, and Syria's Golan Heights, which it occupies to this day. Military defeat dealt a heavy blow to the nationalist leaders of Syria and Egypt and weakened the more leftist and radical forces within both regimes. In the case of Egypt, this led to the ascension of a pro-imperialist regime after Nasser's <coughs> death in 1970. Uh, in Syria, Jadid was defeated by Hafez al-Assad in 1971. Unlike Egypt's Anwar Sadat, Assad was no pro-imperialist leader, but during his years in office, while maintaining his social program, socialist program in name, Assad moved towards a more centrist, typical bourgeois nationalist program. Following his death, um, Hafez al-Assad's death in 2000, the elder Assad was succeeded by his son, Bashar al-Assad, who's the current leader. A point of uh, history about the Middle East is that since the breakup of the Ottoman Empire that we talked about and the division of the Middle East uh, among imperialist powers, States in the Middle East have been predominantly authoritarian and undemocratic in their form. So the imperialists installed right-wing reactionary feudal elements to rule over the different countries, the borders of which were determined by, on the basis of imperialist interests. These were obviously not ideal conditions for the growth of bourgeois democratic rights. So even in countries that broke free from imperialist domination, such as Syria, Libya, and Iran much later following the 1979 revolution, the threat of invasion and overthrow were not exactly conducive to the expansion of those democratic rights. As a result, most states in the region, whether independent or client, have not made significant advances towards bourgeois democratic forms of government. I'm talking about parliaments, elections, uh, freedom of the press, uh, and so on. Severe state repression has been the norm, not the ex exception. And the point to make very clear here is that contrary to the U.S. propaganda about promoting democracy and human rights, the most backwards and the most repressive states in the region are not the independent states but U.S. client states. If we look at Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Bahrain, uh, where royal families rule and there is not even a pretense of elections and parliaments, and interestingly, like Saudi, and Arabia, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are the strongest supporters of what they call you know, democracy in Syria. So the Syrian state, it is true that it has repressed political and economic challenges to its ruling class, and its police forces have a reputation for brutality, and the state was brutal in attempting to put down the demonstrations that started in 2011. In terms of foreign policy, the Assads have not been consistent in taking anti-imperialist positions. To give a couple of examples, in April 19, 1976, the Syrian army invaded Lebanon with the backing of the U.S., which blocked the victory of the progressive forces, which at the time were, were led by the Lebanese National Movement, which, which had a very strong Palestinian component to it. The Syrian state was fearful of a revolutionary victory in Lebanon, which might spread. It was fearing that it might spread throughout the region. Syria also participated in the first imperialist invasion of Iraq in 1991. The Ba'ath Party, of which uh, you know, the, you know, both the Syrian and the Iraqi leadership were of two, di two different branches, had split years earlier, and there was deep animosity between the Iraqi uh, state under Saddam Hussein and Syria. But generally speaking, Syria has remained an independent state, opposed to the domination of the U.S. and Israel in the region, which is why it has long been in the crosshairs of the U.S. for regime change. The country was not opened up to large-scale Western imperialist penetration. The state remains the largest economic entity in the country that controls most of the economy. Multinational corporations don't, which is another reason why, from the imperialist perspective, it needs to be overthrown. Syria played a key role in supporting Lebanese resistance against the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon. In 2000, after 18 years of struggle, the Lebanese resistance succeeded in expelling the Israelis from nearly all of the country's territory. That's Lebanon. Syria has supported the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon, which was uh, responsible, primarily responsible for leading the struggle against the Israelis. Um, and Hezbollah was also the main force resisting the Israeli bombing and occupation of Lebanon in 2006. 
Syria has maintained good relations with revolutionary governments in Latin America, and those governments have sided with the Syrian state against the uh, rebels. Syria has also supported Palestinian resistance forces. Many Palestinian organizations for years maintained their headquarters in Syria, including the leftist Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. In recent weeks, by the way, the Free Syrian Army uh, has attacked and killed some PFLP members in Palestinian refugee camps. There was a lot of coverage on that. Following the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Syria also established closer relations with Iran, which is another regime in the crosshairs of imperialist powers. And also in September 2007, Israel bombed the banks of the Euphrates River in Syria, claiming that their target was a Syrian nuclear facility. So there's no question of the enmity of the US and Israel historically towards the Syrian state. To say a few things about uh, how the recent conflict uh, got started and escalated, uh, it started with a demonstration in Damascus in March 16, 2011 uh, against the state, against Assad. Much larger demonstrations took place in the weeks to come. On March 25th, there were thousands of demonstrations in Hama, which was the site of the 1982 demonstrations and uprising led by the Muslim Brotherhood at the time in 82, where the security forces violently put down the protests, killing thousands of people. So back to the recent conflict, after months of demonstrations and strong state reaction, the conflict evolved into a civil war, which is what we have now, with the formation of the armed militia, which calls itself the Free Syria Army. Now it's not too many demonstrations anymore, it's a civil war, combat between two armed adversaries. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the different political forces involved because again, the false propaganda framework that we primarily get in the US of people versus Assad really keeps us from understanding uh, what's really going on and some of the forces involved. So our framework of analysis of Syria, much like any other conflict, would, it has to you know, start with uh, you know, understanding the real forces on the two sides. Um, just to say another point on the, you know, the popularity of the opposition and so forth, it is accurate to say that the opposition during the months that demonstrations were going on, the opposition mobilized large parts of the population in demonstrations across the country. Some places more, more than others, but it was, it, you know, went across the country. Um, but it's also true that the Syrian state has its base of support. On March 29, 2011, while the demonstrations were going on, Businessweek reported, quote, state-run television showed live footage of hundreds of thousands pouring onto the main streets of Damascus, Aleppo, Hama, and al Hasaka today. And, you know, we've seen photos of, of these things online. There was a poll conducted in spring of 2011 around the same time that gave the Assad government a 53% base of support. The poll had a very small sampling size, so I'm not uh, you know, repeating it for the accuracy of the data, but it's interesting that the poll was uh, funded by an organization from Qatar, which is one of the main funders of the uh, opposition forces. In a recent BBC report, the journalist commented uh, on, uh, the, this is the BBC journalist commented on why a village that was taken over by the Free Syrian Army was so empty of inhabit inhabitants. And he quoted a local, the journalist quoted a local saying that 90% of the villagers were supporters of Assad and they had escaped fearing execution by the rebels. It's also important to add that more than half of eligible voters, more than 51%, turned out for the parliamentary elections that were held in May, in which representatives of several parties and many non-affiliated individuals were elected. Uh, the reason I pointed uh, these points about demonstrations for Assad and the fact that uh, uh, you know, it has a social base also is to again counter uh, the argument that all the people are, are on one side and it's just one repressive state representing 6% of the population, whatever the case may be. It's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, obviously we don't have information as to which side is more popular and it, it may be a very evolving thing. I've read testimonials that some of the people's alliances in terms of which side they supported have changed since the transition from the you know, political demonstrations to uh, the formation of the militias and the fighting and so forth. So let me just say a few things about the forces of the opposition. 
the, well, the best known force uh, here in the West, of course, is a force called the Syrian National Council, or the SNC. Um, it's not a particularly democratic alternative. Uh, it, you know, the US and its imperialist allies played a major role in even forming this group. Uh, most of the leaders, perhaps all of its leaders, don't even have a direct connection to Syria. The former head of the Syrian National Con Council was a university professor by the name of Borhan Ghalyun, who had been, has been living in Paris for decades. The SNC, Syrian National Council, is clearly an openly a pro-imperialist force. In fact, the US and its imperialist allies played a key role in the formation of the SNC and in the definition of its political agenda. The Arab League is also a key supporter of the opposition, and the Arab League primarily consists of UN, US client states. The leading bloc in the Arab League is, is what's called the Gulf Cooperation Council, or the GCC, which is led by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. Again, severely repressive monarchies. So again, it is curious why you would have, if this was simply a case of democracy versus repression, you would wonder why uh, you know, states that are very repressive themselves and don't even have the most rudimentary forms of democratic elections and so forth, why would they go to such distances you know, funding and supporting the opposition forces? But one of the things that the SNC, the Syrian National Council, has failed to do is to unify the opposition forces under one, one umbrella, which is what the US was hoping for. That's why Hillary Clinton, um, in the early fall, basically lost patience with the SNC and in, with typical imperialist um, arrogance said, well, we need a new opposition force that unites everything. And sure enough, a new coalition was formed. The new opposition uh, force is called the National Coalition of Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces, or National Coalition for short. It was formed also in Qatar in November and met in Cairo just last week. And they, they have follow-up meetings uh, scheduled. The Syrian National Council is still the biggest bloc within the new coalition. Just this Monday, uh, the European Union recognized the national coalition as, quote, legitimate representatives of the Syrian people. Now again, we see the role of uh, the imperialists and how they feel like they can determine uh, who represents, who is the legitimate representatives of the Syrian people, or any other people for that matter. So uh, the US has high hopes for the new coalition, as does Turkey and the Gulf Cooperation Council. But again, it's not clear to what extent the imperialist supported coalition can gain acceptance by the forces, by the rebel forces on the ground. Just yesterday, a statement was announced that said, as part of it, it said, quote, we, the fighting squads of Aleppo city and province, unanimously reject the conspiratorial project called the National Council and announce our consensus to establish an Islamic state in Syria. So as this statement makes clear, much of the opposition within Syria is seeking a sectarian form of state under the Sunni sect of Islam. Of the Syrian population, roughly 74% are Sunni Muslims, 13% are Alawites, which is kind of a branch of Shia Islam, about 10% Christians, and small percentages of others. And even nationally, there's, of course, about a 10% Kurdish population and the rest mostly Arabs. Uh, there's smaller numbers of other nationalities as well. The current Ba'ath government is actually a secular state, encompassing not just Alawites, but Sunnis and Christians. So, you know, just on that note, going from a secular state to a sectarian form of government is obviously not progress. And we could clearly see in Iraq, one of the main strategies of the US and, and the British was to try to get much of the Iraqi population to re-identify themselves as Sunni and Shia because that would you know, weaken the national unity of the Iraqis and, and people of the Arab nation and to get them to see the enemy or uh, the opposition as the people of the other sect. Another major force in Syria is the Muslim Brotherhood, 
uh, which is re the only real force, uh, which is not necessarily a dominant force in, in Syria on the ground uh, in, in among the rebels, but it is the only real force that is represented in the Syrian National Council. And of course, the Muslim Brotherhood, as I said earlier, has been um, engaged for decades uh, fighting the Syrian government in favor of secular, uh, of a sectarian, specifically a Sharia-based Sunni form of government. Leaders of the Syrian Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood are mostly based in Saudi Arabia, which again is one of the most reactionary Arab states. And the Muslim Brotherhood leaders have openly called for intervention specifically by Turkey and Jordan, including uh, direct military action. And of course there's other forces, as we can see there's uh, in, in the, you know, some of the media coverage talks about Al-Qaeda and other jihadis uh, who are also, many of whom are not Syrian but are in Syria, not a majority of the forces by any means, but that's another force or, or set of individuals and forces that are involved. Just last week in Damascus there were twin suicide bombings that killed dozens of people and this has been a recurring thing, the suicide bombings and other such operations. And you know, as I'm concluding uh, this part about the different forces, particularly different political formations, I wanna uh, mention that as we're talking about the, particularly the demonstrations that started, we're talking, we, you know, we, we're talking about individuals with different grievances. There, were, there was the economic crisis in Syria, uh, of course, influenced at least in part by the economic, you know, the capitalist economic, you know, crisis. There's corruption, there's repression, and there's, uh, there, there were Kurds who have demands for autonomy. You know, there's a variety of grievances, of motivations of people entering demonstrations and so forth. But what I'm trying to describe here is the organized forces that exist and the, you know, potential alternatives for political power. There is, of course, the uh, force call that calls itself the Free Syrian Army. This is a militia that operates mainly out of Turkey, receives some of its uh, staging ground, uh, grounds and uh, training in Turkey, and has you know, by various estimates, tens of thousands of fighters, now maybe more. Um, it consists of defected, defected military personnel uh, as well as others. Um, the FSA command has declared support for the national coalition and previously for the Syrian National Council. But there has also been infighting between different uh, free Syrian army ar armed groups. Uh, and it does not have a very clean record either. A few months ago, Human Rights Watch, which is a very conservative right-wing human, you know, human rights organization, the George Soros-founded um, organization, Human Rights Watch released a report describing human rights violations carried out by the members of Syria's armed opposition. Of course, Human Rights Watch has released many such reports about the state, but I think it's significant that they've released some about the Free Syrian Army. And I'm quoting from this report. Armed anti-Assad opposition groups have been kidnapping both civilians and members of the state security forces and demanding ransom money for their from their families, end quote. And you know, some of us may have seen the YouTube videos of the rebels um, throwing postal workers and other government workers who were part of uh, unions off the roof of, of a building, which again, wasn't a very um, democratic thing to do. Uh, but again, the reason I'm mentioning this is to, uh, you know, uh, basically challenge the notion of democracy versus Assad. The Obama administration has been aiding the Free Syrian Army. The WikiLeaks revealed uh, that the U.S. has even had forces, special forces on the ground training them. It has been reported now by all major media outlets that the Free Syrian Army has been getting more and better weapons, more sophisticated and better weapons, in an effort paid for, at least in part, by the Gulf Cooperation Council nations and coordinated by the United States. Last week there was a video released that showed a, uh, an FSA fighter with a heat-seeking missile on his shoulder. There's also another complexity, another um, kind of front to the question is the Kurdistan question. Earlier this week, there was a report that six rebels were killed in clashes with the Kurdish fighters in, in the Kurdistan region. Uh, given all the fighting that's been going on in Aleppo and, and uh, Damascus, and of course many other areas, the Syrian state has really not have, had enough forces to try to control areas of Kurdistan in the, 
uh, in the north of the country, and now Kurdish armed groups are kicking out the rebels, the, the, the free Syrian army rebels. And of course, the major news now is that NATO is installing Patriot missiles in Turkey next to the Syrian border. And of course, the excuse that they give for that action is that they want to defend Turkey against Syria. And of course, this is a lie. First of all, Turkey has a stronger military than Syria to begin with. Secondly, Syria has no motivation whatsoever to seek a war with, with Turkey. Um, and if it was just a matter of the NATO allies defending Turkey, Turkey wouldn't even need that help. But the reality is that there's many things you can shoot with a Patriot missile, and it's uh, not just intercepting um, Syrian missiles that support, uh, supposedly Syria is going to fire at Turkey, but it may be a backdoor to the, you know, the no-fly zone. Uh, people might remember that in the case of Libya, the U.S. managed to push through a resolution of a no-fly zone, and the no-fly zone, which started out as saying we're going to defend civilians and so forth, became the license to first, you know, do the aerial, aerial bombing of much of Libya, attempt assassination of Gaddafi, and then it became an all-out involvement in, in the support of the rebels, whereas, in fact, the rebels were playing a secondary role to the role that NATO played. But in the case of Syria, uh, Russia and China have not agreed to that, so the question is, is the installing of the Patriot missiles on the border, is that another possible way that they're trying to do their no-fly zone uh, over Syria? Uh, another thing that, that's also been a lot in the news is the chemical weapons issue. So yesterday, the White House Press Secretary Jay Carney said, quote, we are concerned that an increasingly beleaguered regime, having found its escalation of violence through conventional means inadequate, might be considering the use of chemical weapons against the Syrian people. Uh, again, this is another weapons of mass destruction claim. I mean, it's, it's not even known whether there are such weapons. If there are such weapons, are they really being moved? If they are, they are being moved, is, are they being moved because the state is trying to use them, or is it possible that they're moving them to keep the rebels from getting hold of the you know, weapons? Um, and it's not even clear how the state, no matter how ruthless it might be, how can it, in a practical sense, use chemical weapons within a, 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 a civil war. But I think it's, again, it serves the same purpose as weapons of mass destruction, again, getting this frenzy whipped up against the state so that uh, if there is further escalation of conflict and in intervention on the part of the U.S. and its imperialist allies, this is, uh, you know, a public relations campaign. During these, uh, all these months, uh, th there's been one major attempt on the part of uh, Kofi Annan, who represented both the United Nations and the Arab League. That, like I said, the Arab League is not exactly um, an impartial um, body. But anyway, the plan was to have 300 monitors to monitor a ceasefire, but it was not really allowed to proceed. And if people read the details, I mean, what was happening is that it was not the Syrian state that was, was not willing to go along with the ceasefire, it was the opposition, it was the rebels. And the main reason for that is that the opposition had the precondition for real negotiations of Assad stepping down, which kind of, you know, defeats the purpose of negotiations if you're preconditions for the other side to accept defeat. Um, but I think, uh, you know, part of that, it also goes to the, the role that U.S. intervention has already played. And we're not even talking about the real danger of U.S. getting involved directly, bombing and such. But I think had it not been for the fact that the rebels knew that they would have the support of the U.S., France, Britain, and the rest of them, um, and had, for that reason, had they not thought that time was going on their side, there may ha well have been, you know, negotiated agreements somewhere along this process. But I think, uh, you know, the, the role that the U.S. played and the fact that very early on both Obama and Clinton said Assad must step down really, uh, you know, made the rebel leadership reach the point that they didn't want to negotiate at all. So... I mean, I think I need to uh, wrap up pretty shortly, but um, I mean, it has been a major and very bloody campaign. I mean, there are, the numbers are very hard to come by, but um, I mean, um, there have been definitely thousands, 
probably tens of thousands uh, killed. The number that the U.S. media are giving are based on the uh, you know, Human Rights Observatory Commission in London that, that gives the number 40,000. So we don't know, but it's definitely a, a, uh, a very, um, a, a very um, bloody campaign. Uh, in the last few, few weeks, the Free Syrian Army, uh, even though it has not really been able to hold down to any major areas in Aleppo and Damascus, but their attacks seem to have become more successful. They seem, they, they have uh, switched focus and they have launched a lot of attacks within Damascus, the capital itself. Uh, they have caused disruptions in air traffic in the areas, uh, you know, near the airport and so forth. So. Uh, it is hard to tell for sure, but you know many of the reports indicate that the Free, free Syrian Army has strengthened relatively in, in recent weeks. Um, some of the plans of the U.S. and its allies. I mean, we already talked about uh, the uh, Patriot missiles. That is very significant. There has been talks of setting up a what's called a safety zone on the border of Turkey to better organize the FSA. Of course, much of this has already been uh, going on. Uh, and of course, you know, Syria has been under sanctions, uh, which has caused, you know, an economic crisis. And they are hoping, the imperialists are hoping that the ongoing sanctions, the ongoing civil war will, you know, gradually put the rebels at a relative advantage over a state that has lost you know, uh, some of its source of revenue, not just because of the sanctions, but the very nature of the civil war that has been going on, of course, has caused uh, a lot of damage to, uh, to the economy of the country. So I'm just gonna close uh, by saying, what is our responsibility here in the US as socialists, as anti-war activists? I mean, the main thing is that we don't necessarily have to agree on the specific of the analysis of the forces in the civil war. But I think what we have to agree on is that our primary role here is to oppose imperialist intervention. What we have to do is to make sure this government, this government that gets its funding from uh, the people here, and this government that has you know, uh, really uh, committed more crimes than any other entity in the world in the last half century, and has had its hands in every major uh, atrocity that has been going on, our primary task is to not decide the future of the Syrian state. That's for the people of Syria to decide. Our primary task is to stop to the extent that we can through struggle, through a campaign, to stop the US from intervening in, in Syria, whether it's direct military intervention or arming the rebels or sanctions or any other form. So we have to oppose all those forms of intervention. US hands up Syria.